Good morning. Welcome to Village Presbyterian Church. My name is Susan Kreidenberg, and on behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you to our Presbyterian Women Visiting Scholar Program. This year, as you know, we are privileged to be hosting Walter Brueggemann. And if you were here last night, you know he's both inspiring and entertaining. Um, I've been charged with giving you a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, we have a lost and found. There are a few things that have been dropped between here and Fellowship Hall. There's a table in Fellowship Hall that has those items, so if you're missing anything, please check there. Um, we will be breaking today about 10.15 and have a 15-minute break um, in Fellowship Hall. There's more cookies. Please feel free to eat as many as you'd like. Um, there's coffee, lemonade, water, so we'll take a little break then, and then we'll reconvene back in here. Um, because of our wonderful turnout, we are running a little low on programs, so if you had a program, um, if you could share it with your neighbor, we would appreciate you filling out the evaluations that are included in the program, and there will be people picking those up with baskets after the program today. Um, and then one little announcement, next year we will be um, hosting Brian McLaren in March, March 9th and 10th, and we'll be sending out emails and more information about that, but if you plan ahead, if you're that far in advance, we'd love to have you back. Um, I think that's all I need to say, so I'll ask Meg McLaughlin to please introduce our speaker. Thank you. Before I tell you what's in store, I wondered if we could share a word of prayer. God, you are mysterious, and yet without you, our living makes no sense. We trust that you are here, and we pray that you will find something pleasing about our mourning, something in our thinking and in our speaking, something in our questioning and in our listening, something in the stirring of our heart that would bring you glory and honor. We seek to know ourselves, to know our neighbors, and to know you, O oh God in the particular ways that you are made known. Guide us this morning as we learn. Humble us as we discover. Forgive us as we blunder. And startle us with your truth that pushes us out into your world to live differently than we did yesterday. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I get to introduce to you our visiting scholar for this year, and if you were here last night, he needs no introduction, but Dr. Walter Brueggemann is a preacher's kid who grew up across the state line near Marshall, Missouri, so he's coming home today. He went to school at Elmhurst College, Eden Seminary, Union Seminary in New York, and St. Louis University. He taught at his alma mater, Eden Seminary, in St. Louis for 25 years, and then he joined the faculty in Atlanta, Georgia at Columbia Theological Seminary, which is one of our 11 Presbyterian seminaries. He retired from there in 2003, but has not in the least retired from his work and passion for teaching and for writing. Dr. Brueggemann is a prolific author, a poet, and a man of prayer. As part of my continuing education as a pastor, I'm part of a group of preachers that meets once a year. We're scattered across the nation and we come together for a week and each of us writes two papers on two different biblical texts. And inevitably over the years, if one of us chooses an Old Testament scripture, we quote Dr. Brueggemann almost every time, it seems. Something from one of his commentaries or one of his books. Many of the preachers in this group have been Dr. Brueggemann's students. All of us have been formed by his scholarship. So as the years have gone on in this group and as our papers continue to hold these tidbits of Brueggemann's work, we've moved away from the very formal footnotes that say, Dr. Brueggemann, this book, this page. And we've just started saying, 
Uncle Walt says. <laughs> Uncle Walt says. This morning, we have Uncle Walt in this room. And if you heard him last night, you were reminded that the beginning of our life of faithfulness and dignity in this wild world is baptism, that we belong to God. So if this is true, if we belong to God, if you do and I do and Dr. Brueggemann does, then it's true that this man is part of our family, our family of faith. For belonging to God means we belong to one another. So it's appropriate to call him our uncle. So help me now welcome this scholar, our guest today, and our uncle in the faith, Dr. Brueggemann. Thanks for that. The reference to uncle reminds me that the twins were born and uh, the family couldn't take care of them, so the uncle and aunt took the twins and took care of them. And uh, the parents said after a couple weeks, uh, have you named the twins? Uh, and he said, yes, we call the little girl Denise. And we call the little boy the nephew. <laughs> well, um, uh, I'm glad to be with you this morning that you braved the ice. Uh, but then I thought, well, what else could you do on such a morning as this? You'd just as well be in church. Uh, but I do not uh, take lightly uh, that you're investing your Saturday morning, and, and I hope that uh, this will turn out to be useful to you. Uh, I will allow some time um, in each of these hours for some uh, give and take, and uh, we'll want to do that um, with you. Uh, I do want to say about next year uh, that you will find Brian McLaren uh, extraordinarily interesting and uh, generative, and uh, you will be fortunate to have him uh, at the church. In this hour, I want to talk about the church's task of interpretation uh, because I believe that interpretation is the most important uh, and among the most difficult tasks that the church has because interpretation is the process of making a segue from an ancient world to a new world. Uh, that's what interpretation has always been every time the preacher gets up to ask, what do these ancient texts mean for the way we live now? And that's a huge act of imagination for which the preacher gets thanked after church for things she never said and gets blamed for church uh, after church for things he never said. So we are now in a process of segue from a world that is disappearing before our very eyes and a world that's coming, the shape of which we cannot yet see. And it is the church's pivotal responsibility to help people make that move faithfully. So that's what I'm going to talk about. The United Church of Christ, which is my church, you may know, now has as its uh, public relations slogan, God is still speaking, uh, by which the church means to say that God didn't quit after the Bible. And the logo that my church has adopted, as you know, is a, is a comma. And Jane Hoffman, my friend, if you go out in the parking lot, you will see her car that has a comma on the side of it, uh, by which we mean that, uh, that the Bible doesn't have a period after it. It has a comma, and the conversation continues. 
Now, I've decided that my work in the United Church of Christ is to keep reminding the church there is some stuff that's important in front of the comma. <laughs> and I will let you in on a, on a little secret. What that's really about, I think, in the United Church of Christ uh, is what the Bible says about gays and lesbians. That, that's really the issue that you cannot just repeat what the Bible says because the Bible is pretty clear about that, but God is still speaking. And we belong to a theological tradition uh, in which we believe that God is still speaking. So I want to think with you about how we got in the fix we're in in American religion. Fundamentalism is a modern problem that is peculiarly American that tries to turn the Bible into scientifically manageable certitude, and it is a peculiarly Calvinist problem, not Calvin, Calvinism. And historically, I don't know whether this will offend anyone, Princeton Seminary is the great conduit of fundamentalism, where it was taught, and then all those people went out and became teachers in other seminaries and, and so on. But the liberal response to fundamentalism, historically, has been, has been historical criticism. That's what taught in our seminaries, and I have done that for a long time. Historical criticism specializes in original meanings, which should remind you of Justice Scalia, who thinks that he secretly knows the original meaning of the Constitution. And what you can see is that Justice Scalia wants to keep the Constitution away from any of the really important problems in our society. And what historical criticism has done is to keep the Bible remote from how we live our life. So what happens to people when they graduate from seminary is that they discover in three weeks that you can't preach historical criticism. <laughs> so what you do is you do the Bible as though you had never been to seminary anyway, because that doesn't work. So the problem we've got is to how to find our way, given fundamentalism on the one hand and given historical criticism on the other hand, to try to figure out how to do faithful generative interpretation. And what I want to, I want to do two things this morning. First of all, I want to talk about that process in the Bible. And then secondly, I want to reflect on how that is happening in our society. The big questions in the Bible that we quarrel about are ethical questions. Well, you can have disputes about the nature of Holy Communion, and we've done that for a while, and you can argue about the nature of Christ, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. I thought you'd like to know I know that. But that, neither, one of, neither the Eucharist nor Christology will generate a lot of adrenaline. It's ethics that gets you. 